Good morning, everyone. We are on to session seven of the church today. And the topic that we are looking at for today is the significance and destiny of the church, looking at it for part one. Uh, so in previous sessions, we laid the grounds of the problems that men caused by not following God's plan and destiny from the time that uh, man sinned and up to today. So in this session, we look at the significance and destiny of the church to fulfill what mankind failed as a race. And so the first thing we look at is the role of the church now. So everything that we have been looking at now leads us to the church coming in to play a role. And Jesus had a mission with various, let me, Jesus had a mission with various objectives for himself when he came to woo his disciples to be part of the church. He had in mind that the church that is birthed from his disciples would continue to carry out the same mission during his absence. Uh, before he left, the disciples, you know, you read in the uh, New Testament, before he left his disciples to return to the Heavenly Father to prepare a place for his bride. In John chapter 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. He told them what they had to do in the interim before his return. And what was that? They were to fulfill his commission. That's the plan. And basically, um, Jesus told the disciples and from them, the church, that while he was gone, they should carry out the same mission that he did. And they were familiar with it because he trained them. So how Jesus patterned the church. In his commission to the disciples, he set the pattern to grow his church. And the first thing, the basic thing is he proclaimed the kingdom. Uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, here I quote just one reference, Matthew, Mark 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And Jesus himself preached the gospel for people to repent. That means to change their priorities, their lifestyle and their goals to live according to God's kingdom character. So he is presenting the gospel, the good news, for people to switch from what they used to live as uh, when they rejected God. Now he is telling them how they can follow God's way um, totally, totally, yes. So this is Jesus, you know, after he was, after John was put in prison, remember I said that there's only this window of time for Messiah to come. Very specific window of time. Very short period of time where Messiah must come during John's ministry. So now John was put in prison and then later on he would be beheaded. So anybody who has not come, you know, uh, before John went into prison and then got beheaded later, anybody who has not come cannot be the Messiah anymore. So now Jesus, the authentic Messiah, went to preach the good news. Okay? And so uh, he proclaimed the kingdom. That's the first thing. And this is what God himself did, proclaiming the kingdom. So that he came as a man to proclaim the gospel. And then he sent his disciples to do what he himself did. Remember, this is something that we, we have said from time to time. God will tell people to do what he himself would do. And so God himself saw the importance of preaching the kingdom. 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so he says, disciples should follow and do the same, right? Whatever, G whatever God did, he tells his people to follow and do. So besides proclaiming the kingdom with the gospel, he made disciples. And we can see the references from Luke 4, uh, John 1, Mark 1, and Mark 3, 4 to 14 to 15 that I've quoted here. He appointed 12 disciples that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Okay, so you can see here, internet is unstable. Okay, they might be with him. That's the first thing about his uh, discipleship. Then send them out to preach. That's another one. And then have authority to drive out demons. So this is him making disciples with these three purposes. Be with him. They spend time with him. Uh, observing him. Learning from him. And then he would send them out to preach. And they would have his authority to drive out demons. You can see that Jesus appointed specific men to be his disciples. And the disciples were learning. You can see they were learning and they were learning firsthand by being with him. Then listening to his teaching and then observing all that he did. So that is discipleship from Jesus himself. And then disciples and disciples have to be together. Yes, they have to be together in first-hand experience. That's why we cannot have church uh, on internet and keep it that way because there's no first-hand experience of each other and Christ among them, right? So there are many reasons as we explore, you see why internet church is only a measure to you know, avoid pandemic, but it's not the sustainable long-term thing. It's not intended to be like that. Okay, so he made disciples, right? He proclaimed the, the kingdom and the gospel. He made disciples and then he trained the disciples to have first-hand practice of what he did. Okay, so for three things, proclaim the kingdom, make disciples, and then train the disciples to have first-hand practice. Okay, first-hand practice. So they have to do a practicum. They have to do a practicum of what he did because they were learning, listening, observing, and being with him. So Luke 9, 1 to 2, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive up all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So exactly what he had been doing and what he, his objective was, now he did it. Right? Gave them power and authority to drive up demons, cure diseases, and send them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. So he trained the disciples by sending them out to do it for themselves. First-hand experience for themselves. To preach and then to drive up demons, as we see from the reference there, with the same authority. Yeah, same authority that he would endow on them later on at the Great Commission that we see in Matthew 28, verses 18 and to 20. So that was Jesus sending out the 12, and then in Luke chapter 9, and then in Luke chapter 10, we see that after this, he appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And then the story went. He gave all the instructions and they left. Then verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So they looked happy as well as surprised. Even the demons submit to us. There are a whole lot more people a whole lot more people who need to receive the good news of the kingdom than workers to bring the gospel to them even today. That is the truth that Jesus told his disciples. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Pray, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. So what was true at that time is still true today. We still need a whole lot more workers. And therefore, Jesus told his disciples to pray for more workers so that they can harvest the people who are ready to choose to belong to God's kingdom. And so we can see just from what we have done, Jesus sent out the inner circle of his 12 disciples as well as the larger group of 72 disciples on their practice they had seen Jesus in action and that would be useless to them unless they practiced it for themselves. Okay, so the whole idea of discipleship is they must learn and then they must themselves go and do it. And it was unexpected, but it happened. For the 72 that went, they found that though it was not within their own experience or imagination to cast out demons. You know, we don't think about casting out demons when we spread the gospel. But they could imitate what Jesus did, right? Whatever God does, we, when we're told to do, we can do it by imitating God. So when they used Jesus' name to drive out demons, it worked. That's why they said, even the demons submit to us in your name. They were surprised and they returned with joy. They were successful in imitating Jesus with their assigned mission. And they were joyful and amazed that the demons were subjected to them under the authority of Jesus' name. So they were very happy when they came back. Jesus commissioned his disciples to do everything that he had taught, he had demonstrated, he had trained, and he had prepared them to do. That's basically the work of Jesus in having disciples. Do everything he had taught. He had shown them, he had trained them. Now they had the practice and they, he prepared them to do. So Jesus made and trained disciples, as we can see, and he wants us to make and train disciples too. That is his, that is his uh, commission. While he is away, he told the church to do the same mission. So the church, like the first disciples, must recognize and focus on the emphasis of Jesus' great commission. So having said that, there's this challenge of clarity. Challenge of clarity and scope. Okay, uh, Whether we are clear about the Great Commission, that's the clarity. And the scope is to what extent, what does this, uh, the Great Commission cover? Yeah. So we have this challenge of clarity and scope today. See, Jesus commissioned his disciples. What exactly did he commission his disciples to do? There are Christians who say that performing miracles, casting out demons, all these things no longer apply today. They say all this died out with the apostles, with the disciples of Jesus in the New Testament generation. They say all that died out. Let us examine this claim 
logically. And let's do that by looking at the details of Jesus' great commission. We are all very familiar with uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20 uh, instructions. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So he gave the disciples the practice uh, and gave them authority to cast up demons and so on. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When Jesus accomplished his mission, by humbling himself to the point of being obedient to death, he received the highest authority over all creation. All right, so there you have Jesus talked about all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is the resurrected Christ talking to them. Yes, the resurrected Christ told them all authority in the spiritual realm and on earth has been given to him and philippians 2 verses 9 to 11 paul confirms therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So there we have it. God exalted him to the highest place that every tongue acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. And so he is able to tell his disciples at his Matthew 28 commission, all authority in heaven and on earth given to me so go and make disciples. Therefore, go is a response to him having highest authority. Okay, so his commission, because of his highest authority, he says, therefore, go. Then what do you do? The blue ones is what they are supposed to do. Make disciples, baptize, teach, obey everything Jesus commanded. Okay, and then he tells us his presence will be with them, with his disciples, always. And how long is this always? Is it only the lifetime of the apostles, New Testament apostles? Not according to this commission. It says to the very end of the age. Yeah, so he's with them always. So that means to the end of their lives and then to the very end of the age means till the earth ends. The earth has not ended. So Jesus is still with his disciples today and this great commission would still be valid today. Okay, so to the very end of the age. That's how long this commission lasts. So Jesus made it clear, making disciples includes teaching to obey, teach to obey, to obey everything he commanded the disciples. So does obey everything include casting out demons and performing miracles? The disciples indeed did both. They cast out demons and they performed miracles. And you can look at Acts chapter 3, verses 2 to 10, uh, chapter 5, verse 12, and then chapter 8, verses 6 to 7. Uh, on your own time, you see that the disciples did cast out demons and perform miracles. And Jesus also assured he would be with his disciples to the very end of the age. Would this not therefore mean that his authority to cast out demons and so on still stands for all time to the very end of the age. Even though 
the first generation of disciples die and they are succeeded by new generations of disciples. Not just in the time of those apostles in the New Testament, but to the very end of the age. Okay, so that is the Matthew Gospel. Then looking at the Mark Gospel, Mark 16, verses 14 to 18, uh, would somebody like to help us to read this? I read uh, Mark 16, uh, verse 14. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Thank you, Meg. Right, so this is uh, Mark's account to add on to the Matthew Great Commission. Mark's Great Commission uh, includes all those signs that accompany the people who believe, right? And you see that a lot of these are the miracles, um, the manifestations of uh, power gifts, what people call power gifts, as well as uh, speaking in tongues. So Mark records explicitly that the disciples are to preach the gospel. He says, preach the gospel to all creation. So we know uh, we preach, of course, to human beings. We don't preach to the plants, right? Plants are also creation. Yeah, preach to all human beings, drive up demons, speak in new tongues, and perform all these other miracles. And Jesus says that these are signs, signs that will accompany those who believe. There in red. Huh? So all who believe can expect that these signs do happen and in fact in just now we saw uh we quoted x chapter 3 5 and 8 they actually did happen those signs or miracles the bible account does not tell of any disciple who drank deadly poison though so there are some things jesus mentioned here that we don't read in the bible he said they drink deadly poison. It will not hurt them at all. Okay. Bible does not tell us of any such incident. It was unhurt. Although it does tell of Paul being bitten by a viper, a poisonous snake, but then nothing happened to him. That's in Acts chapter 28, verses 3 to 6, when he was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And so uh, we see that, we see that, uh, the Jesus actually specifies signs. Jesus specifies signs that are both found and not found recorded in the Bible. So based on those that we have seen happening, we can take it on good faith based on what Jesus said, that both groups were done by his disciples, although one group, that means the pick up snakes with their hands and drink deadly poison, it doesn't hurt them at all. That, that one group has no record found in the Bible. That's not to say that today we start going around to drink poison. <laughs> okay? It's not, it's not telling us to go around drinking poison. It's, it's in the context that if out of persecution for them, at that, uh, for them, okay? Um, the drinking of deadly poison might, uh, would not hurt them. So in history, perhaps we might uncover some historical record of uh, somebody drinking deadly poison, but they may or may not know it. So whether there's a record is another thing, but uh, that's what Jesus said. Okay, and picking up snakes with their hands and of course not dying from there. 
So Mark, once again, you see, uh, Mark does not record a time, time frame, right? God, Mark does not record a time limit for when these signs will end. He says, these signs will accompany those who believe. But if we take it as part of the whole Great Commission, yeah, if we accept it as part of the whole Great Commission, that the time frame is consistent with Matthew's account of the commission, which means that Jesus is with believers and disciples till the end of the age, and his authority to carry out all the acts is still valid with each generation, as it happened with the 12 and then the 72 disciples, then this great commission should be valid still today. Because the end of the age and his authority, they are all still valid to us. Okay, so that was uh, Matthew and Mark. Then we have uh, Luke. So we see that as they go, uh, Matthew contains quite a lot of uh, the details, the big bulk of the Great Commission. Mark gave quite a lot of details. Luke gave a little less. Luke 24, 46 to 49, he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. God promised to give the Holy Spirit, which is a gift. Yeah but they are supposed to stay until the Holy Spirit came on them and gave them power. And that would be Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came. And in this case, Luke adds that preaching in his name to all nations. Again, indicating Jesus' authority goes with the preaching to all of creation, as Mark called it, all of creation. Jesus said, go into all the world. Yeah. And that preaching includes repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So each gospel adds their own little extra to give us the whole picture of the great commission of Jesus. John, John is the shortest and simplest. John chapter 20, 21 to 23, because the other three have already mentioned the bulk. And so here, again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So John only needs to add the remainder of the Great Commission. He simply adds that both the Father and Jesus sent them. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So you see, Jesus is telling the disciples, do the same mission that I did. He breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. They were authorized to, to forgive sins as Jesus did forgive sins. You might remember Matthew chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. He told the men to pick up the mat. He told the men that his sins were forgiven and to pick up the mat. And then the, the religious leaders were thinking, hmm, this man, how dare he say your sins, sins are forgiven? Only God forgives sins. But Jesus says he has authority to forgive sins and also heal the men. And he healed the men. So now Jesus is telling disciples, they are authorized to represent him, to forgive sins as Jesus did. And this will bring uh, people freedom from guilt. Yeah. Bring people from guilt and the prison of guilt and all that comes with uh, guilt and shame for sin. So the question now comes to us, does his 
commission still apply as a whole today? Or does only part of it apply or all of it apply or not at all? The whole thing doesn't apply to us. So what, there are three options, right? The commission can apply to us as a whole today or only part of it or the whole thing is, does not apply to us. There are those who advocate that the spiritual supernatural gifts and miracles belong to that period of time and they quote 1 Corinthians 13 to claim that these things are things of the past. Okay, so you look at 1 Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Can somebody help us to read, please? First Corinthians 13, 8 to 10. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so uh, love never fails, so it never ends, but there are prophecies that will cease, there are tongues that will be stilled, where there's knowledge, it will pass away. Um, so what we know is part, and what we prophesy is part. That means we don't have the whole picture. And Paul says, when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. The thing about this Quoting this reference is a problem because this reference does not specify a time frame, whereas the Great Commission does. Yeah, This reference does not say only up to so long. It only says where there are prophecies, they will cease, tongues will be still, knowledge will pass away, and the only time frame is when completeness comes. The question is, completeness is not the same as like end of the age, which is very specific. Yeah, when exactly is completeness? What it does say is that when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. The question then is, what is completeness? People can speculate and assume to support their theology and belief, but today we certainly don't have complete knowledge yet. If we have complete knowledge, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be debating, right? If we have, con for example, we have complete knowledge that Jesus died on the cross to forgive us our sins. If we have this complete knowledge, we wouldn't be arguing about this, right? But we don't have complete knowledge where do have prophecies truly ceased? Is knowledge, where there's knowledge, it will pass away. Has knowledge passed away? because there's completeness? No, we still have knowledge, right? So chances are these will be complete when we stop living on earth, which is to say end of the age as well. So if prophecies, tongues, and knowledge will pass away only at the end of the age, then the Great Commission to perform miracles and all that will definitely still apply. Okay, uh, in, in nowhere in the Great Commission does Jesus actually say that it will only last the time of the apostles in the New Testament. We certainly don't have complete knowledge yet. So we cannot say that all these have passed away. It can only be an assumption to say that these things ceased when the apostles died. That's only an assumption right, uh, which people are saying. But it can also be blasphemous to claim that those who speak in tongues or cast out demons do so in the authority of Satan. Like what happens in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32, which we will look at in a moment later, right? Jesus was casting out demons. Uh, yeah, Jesus healed a demon-possessed man, was blind and mute, 
And then the Pharisees claimed he healed people by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And Jesus gave some important pointers on what they claimed. They are that he healed um, the men or people by the prince of demons. So he said in Matthew chapter 12, which we are looking at, verse 26, he says, if Satan drives out Satan, then Satan is divided against himself and his kingdom cannot stand. So what Jesus said in his day applies today. If Satan drives out Satan, his kingdom cannot stand. He's divided against himself. He's fighting. His own people are fighting each other. Anyone who is not with Jesus is against him. And he who does not gather with Jesus scatters. Matthew 12, 13. Basically meaning those who don't work with Jesus are opposing his work. They are scattering. They are messing up his work. And then in uh, Matthew 12, 31 to 32, which I quoted, uh, I said here, yeah, he said, men will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So he cast out demons and he performed healing and all that by the power of God. And they say he did it by the power of the prince of demons. And his power is Holy Spirit. And they are claiming Holy Spirit is demon. Okay, so that's why it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, to call Holy Spirit evil. Miracles, including healing and casting out of demons in Jesus' authority, can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, for any disciples to cast out demons, he must, he has no power of his own to do it. It's the power and authority of Jesus. And Jesus goes on in Matthew 12, 33 to 34. A tree is recognized as good or bad by its fruit. And he tells these, and he tells that these religious leaders are a brood of vipers, so they can only speak evil and not anything good. Yeah, so a tree is recognized by its fruit, good or bad. For Jesus, these religious leaders can only speak evil and not anything good. So men have to give account on the day of judgment for every callous word they have spoken. By their words, they will be acquitted or condemned. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. So in the context of this whole thing, yes, uh, we have to be very careful not to make assumption that all the mirac miracles of the uh, Great Commission, the possibility of miracles is gone and then be reminded by Jesus that uh, blasphemers to claim that the work of the Holy Spirit in behind what people do is satanic. So what we can see and say is the Great Commission comes as one complete commission. It does not make sense to believe that this commission continues to be relevant today, but that part, just that part about miracles, casting out of demons is not. All right? It's, it's, very, it's very selective to say that, oh, the Great Commission is applicable today, but only this part, this part, that part, no, not applicable, stop already. It's very weird, right? You know, out of one whole thing, the part that you don't feel comfortable or you feel that, hey, my opinion is we don't do that kind of thing, uh, stop. It doesn't apply to us. So that is being selective to single, single out the parts which people are not comfortable with or are not practicing and then interpreting them as uh, belong to the time of the apostles, the New Testament. This is called adding to the word of God and making human opinion equal to God's word to fit human practice and human comfort or discomfort zone. It's a little bit like, you know, we, we looked at this concept, something similar with the, the days of creation. Yeah, we accepted the days of creation uh, 
are six normal days of 24 hours. But when we are confronted by the theory of evolution that uh, the six days must be millions of years for evolution to take place, we are kind of like being selective, right? Because if we say in the six days that God created, each day is, a, for example, millions and millions of years. But then later on, when God says that you are to do your work in six days and rest on the Sabbath day, those six days suddenly become 24-hour days. You know what I mean? It, there is a mismatch. If we interpret the six days of creation as millions of years per day, and then God says, uh, you are to do your work six days and rest on the Sabbath day. How come those six days are not millions and millions of years? Right? So that, yeah, we find it very funny and inconsistent, right? Okay. So that is being selective to fit theory of evolution. Now we are being selective to fit those Christians who are not comfortable or who don't want to do all these things and they tell us, oh, stop already. Okay, so that is adding to the word of God and making human opinion equal to God's word. Another precedent itself is, for example, the precedent of the precedent of the 72 disciples that Jesus sent out. Remember, they went out to preach and cast out demons, and it was clear that they were unsure, they were hesitant, they were uncomfortable also. But that did not stop them from going out and doing what Jesus commissioned them to do. You see, for the 72 disciples just now, we said, it's not within their human experience, right? It's not within their human experience to cast out demons. And so when Jesus told them to go and cast out demons and preach the gospel, they would be very uneasy. But that did not stop them from doing what Jesus commissioned them to do. And that's why, to their amazement and joy, they discovered that demons did actually submit to their authority in Jesus' name. Luke 10, 17. You see, that is consistent. They kind of like were uncomfortable, very queasy, but they did it and they saw the results. So for us today, probably people have not experienced it, have, are not familiar with it. And so they say that, oh, all these things are gone because we don't see it happening in our part of the world, our circle of, uh, our circle of the Great Commission being done. But that does not necessarily mean the whole world, uh, nobody is doing. Okay? So for the 72 disciples, they experienced the sweet taste of success in their practice mission. So they came and told Jesus, wow, even the demons submit to us in your name. Yeah, even the demons submit to us in your name. And in perspective, Jesus focused them. The true reason for joy is your names are written in heaven, not that demons obey you. That is in Luke 10, 18 to 20. Okay, so Jesus says everything in its place. Just because demons submit to you, in my name, don't be so joyful and happy about that for yourself, okay? For yourself, the, the thing for, for joy is joy in salvation. Yeah, maybe you have joy because you're setting people free. Yeah, that is another thing. Okay, so the lesson is be complete, not selective, and see everything in their right balanced perspective. So for the 72 disciples, it was a discovery in process. And like them, today's disciples may be uncertain, but we can certainly learn. Yeah, we're not sure. We don't have experience. Uh, we are a little bit um, in trepidation, a little bit fearful, don't know what to expect, but can certainly learn, just like the 72 disciples. The 72 learned by observing Jesus. In their own practical sending out, they tried out what they saw Jesus doing and discovered that it worked. They set people free from oppressive demons who submitted to their authority from Jesus. 
And this is what many people are still waiting for. You know, whether in Jesus' day or today, many people are waiting to be set free in Jesus' name by his authority. The 72 disciples were uncomfortable and uncertain, but that did not stop them from trying out what Jesus assigned them to do. And that is what disciples can do today to, to rediscover Jesus' commission more fully. And how can we do that? By learning and observing. Just as the 72 observed Jesus, we can learn and observe those who are still doing it today as part of their obedience to Jesus so that the church today can more fully restore Church today can oh sorry. Church today can more fully rest. <laughs> sorry, I just can't get that to work today. Church today can more fully restore and accomplish the whole of the Great Commission. Pause for a moment for you to think about that. Okay, that our trepidation, our concern. It's not new. The 72 disciples had that kind of feeling. Our trepidation, not new because we also, like them, have no such experience, but we can learn just like they learned. So mankind has always remained the same through the ages, with the same needs. Not just the time of Jesus and the apostles, then they have all these needs, you know with more diseases and viruses today plaguing mankind. Yeah, we're talking about COVID-19. The next thing we'll be talking about is COVID maybe 24 or something. You know, more diseases and viruses plaguing mankind in modern times and sicknesses. It makes more sense that man's need for God's power of healing and miracles is at least as great as before. In Jesus' day, and even in the Old Testament. Our need today for God's power of all these miracles continues to be as great as before, at least. So we can come to this question and ask ourselves, are we or are Christians putting words into God's mouth, setting limits on God or maybe on themselves, on ourselves or on other people when we or anyone insist that casting up demons, miracles, and tongues passed out with the apostles. Okay, so the word of God, when we look at it uh, logically, the question is raised that it's something that the 72 disciples themselves were not sure, but they tried it and they learned it and applied it and it worked. Jesus said it best. Jesus said it best just now when we were reading from Mark's record of his Great Commission. Above all, it is a matter that these signs will accompany only those who believe. Mark 16, 17. So if we don't believe, then it will be hard for God to do these signs. Those who do not believe should exercise discretion and not pass judgments or criticism bearing in mind Jesus' warning that it is a sin to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and call what is done by the Holy Spirit done by the evil, evil spirit. They do not see or experience the good fruit. Just now we saw that passage was about good fruit. They do not see or experience the good fruit of those who believe and do the same work as the disciples of Jesus' day. Right. So let us not sit in judgment and criticism. So we see that Jesus did, you know, uh, the role of the church. Jesus patterned the church with his great commission, and he himself led the way by uh, preaching the gospel, making disciples, training them, preparing them. So now it comes to the existence of the church. Yes. We see through the church, God will bridge the gap. Yeah, we, we have talked about the church is part of God's manifold wisdom to accomplish certain things of God, right? So through the church, God will bridge the gap. 
God will bridge the gap between man's failure and God's master plan for men to be servant kings that we, we have uh, mentioned before. Okay, so God will bridge that gap of man's failure. That means selfishness. Yeah, man's failure is basically selfishness. We choose our own way rather than God's way. And God's master plan for men to be servant kings, which is selflessness. Selfless service, just like Jesus. So whatever Jesus did, whatever God did through Jesus, now he's telling men, he's telling his disciples, train disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded and everything Jesus himself did. Okay? So to bridge that gap from selfishness to selfless service like Jesus. So we saw in Ephesians 1, 4 to 10, maybe we can review this uh, can somebody help us to read Ephesians 1, 4 to 10? You want to read it now? Okay, yeah, I read Ephesians 1, 4 to 10. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so there we see God putting everything into place, uh, bringing unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, first through his death on the cross, and after his death and resurrection, it's possible for mankind through the church and through the disciples to bring all things to unity, whereas they do what Jesus did, preach the kingdom, yes, and then uh, make disciples and tell them to obey and do everything that Christ commanded them, bringing everything in heaven and on earth under Christ. So this is what God purposed in Christ to bring all his plans before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in love, Yes, everything all coming together. So God will bridge the gap between man's selfishness, man's failure, and his master plan for men to be selfless in service as servant kings. And this is through the church that God purposed in Christ. Right, in a sense, the Christ will have a bride that will be doing exactly what Christ himself is doing. So Ephesians 3, 8 to 11, Paul continues to say, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. So there you see what Jesus did, preach. So now it's Paul's turn to preach to the Gentiles. Boundless riches of Christ, all that God, Christ has in store for us, all those resources including the love to be selfless servant king, all right? The boundless riches of Christ, he did it and he makes it possible for us to do. And to make known to everyone the administration of this mystery. How does this work? This mystery of Christ, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. 
So before Christ came, we didn't know all these things. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So that includes the angels besides men. Yeah? According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even the angels uh, would be amazed at the wisdom, manifold wisdom of God using very vulnerable and weak human beings that God created. And yet God can work out his eternal purpose in Christ. So God has made this boundless riches of Christ available to, so that the church, through the church, all creation may plainly know God's wisdom and be united under Christ, just as Christians are united under Christ. And so it is the role of the disciples of Christ's universal church in each generation to continue the work of proclaiming to the world of men to know and acknowledge that Christ is Lord and bring all mankind to be united as one under Christ's united as one under Christ's seven king lordship. Remember I said God only tells us to do what he would do and that's what God did. God was the servant king, the ultimate one where highest authority became his. And so now disciples are called to fulfill that role. And for this to be materialized, the disciples of the church must show evidence that they are united under Christ and can then bring this unity as salt and light for the world. What man failed to do with the creation commission on his own mankind, God in his sovereign manifold wisdom and omniscience, will somehow, you know, we, we never imagined it, will somehow accomplish through what Jesus accomplishes through the church. Through the compelling love of Christ who died for us, man may know an unselfish purpose for living. That is not to live for self as man has always done. Each of us who receives and accepts Christ's sacrificial love may live for Christ and the higher purpose that he has given us for living. That's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. Christ's love compels us. We are motivated by Christ's love because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all. Christ is the one that died that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him, for Christ, who died for them and was raised again. So the power of resurrection is the power that helps us to live for Christ. And that is the power of God's great love. So there we have the commission of the church. Jesus' commission forms the mission of the church. Restore. Okay, so our mission is basically to restore knowledge of God and his truth to the world of men. And then do it by preaching the gospel. Because if there's no preaching, people will not know the good news of God's salvation through Jesus and be saved. That's why preaching is so important. It is the start of that restoration. Preaching enables people to repent and turn to the kingdom of God. What do people repent of? Since Adam and Eve left Eden, mankind as a whole have been, has been rejecting, ignoring God, hardening their hearts, living in disobedience, independent of God and his creation commission for men. Yeah? And that includes living in abuse of the natural world God created. Yeah? That's why our world, we talk about climate change, we talk about sustainability of so many things. Yeah, That's because we abuse the natural world, animals that have become extinct or endangered. So we have been distorting the creation commission. That's what we repent of. Okay, we Repent of our disobedience, our hardening, our independence, and doing all these abuse, and also human relationships lacking in love. 
That's why Jesus was prompted to tell the teacher of the law that parable of the Good Samaritan, if you recall, in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, what is my neighbor? Because the great commandment says, love your neighbor as yourself. So who is my neighbor? And so he told the Good Samaritan story and even the religious leader was surprised at Jesus' scope of the concept of neighbor that he is to love. Neighbor is not just somebody that you like or living near to you. Neighbor is anybody you come across. It shows that no matter how we believe ourselves to be religiously and faithfully following God's word, we still fall far short of God's standard of glory. Romans 3.23, that's what, that's what sin is, right? Falling short of God's glory. No matter how religious or faithful we think we are in following God's word, we still fall far short of God's glory. Yeah, so that's what we repent of. The creation commission, we rejected, we failed, we ignored, we forgot, we don't know, and so on. And the human relationships that lack in love, where Jesus means loving your neighbor, is anybody we come across. Thus, preaching calls us to repent. That means turn around from what we have been doing, come turn around to God, God's way, and seek forgiveness for our sins, our failures in God's eyes. So that is preaching the gospel. Healing. You see, the way we have lived, we, we hurt people. People are hurt, wrecked, and damaged. People hurt us, we hurt them. Yeah. So people are made incomplete by sin and selfish living and relationships. Our hu human relationships are very hurting, damaging, and wrecking. In short, the results of our human failure to love and express it in the care. Yes. And without healing, people would remain in ill health physically, and they would be captive physically, mentally, psychologically, and also in social conditions and relationships that prevent people from being able to respond to God's salvation and the role or roles they must play henceforth. So healing is to restore and set us free. Bring us back to where we can do God's work. And so we see that healing is where we need restoration and reinstatement. We need to be restored and reinstated in our value and worth, right? Many people have low self-esteem. Many people have no sense of mission, or purpose. Psychological and spiritual well-being of being made in God's image, restore and reinstate, and the life purpose and commission. Mankind is damaged by sin, deceitfulness of sin, damaged by Satan's work and selfish human nature. Man needs the power of a completing and wholesome divine love that can only be healed by God's divine restoring love and the love of fellow members of God's family. We need both, right? God's divine love is the supernatural part, but we still need a physical agent. And that's where fellow members of God's family so while we need God's love, we also need the love of fellow men in loving out that divine love. I actually thought of putting living out, but somehow I typed out loving out that divine love because we have the love inside us, but it's not coming out in way that are, that ways that are changing, restoring and reinstating people, not healing people. Yeah. So the love of fellow men in loving out that divine love towards each other in order for every one of us to be restored to completion or maturity. Remember, mature is to be made whole, complete, not lacking. So that is the maturity or completeness or wholeness when we have that divine love restoring each other. 
and so we have we have preaching the gospel we have healing then we have teaching without teaching people would not know how to grow in the christian life and change from the old self ways to the new self ways of god's heavenly kingdom people won't know because we are used to this earth we won't know what heaven is like and then teaching at its bottom line addresses the putting off of the old self put off the old self that is needed to escape its deceitfulness. You see, if we don't put off the old self, we will not escape our deceitful uh, behaviors and attitudes, lying and corrupting. Deceitful means they lie and they corrupt us with sinful desires. Deceitfulness includes the lack of love, but that we convince ourselves is love. Yeah, we actually lack that divine love, but we convince ourselves we have that love where we serve to fulfill our personal need for sense of worth, value, and self-esteem. And then we call it God's service for God. Right? So we need to put off the old self and its deceitfulness where we do things because it makes us feel like we are good, we are fine, we are Christians but actually we are doing it to restore our own sense of worth, value and self-esteem, not so much really God's work, which is more completing and more healing. Then that's one, putting off the old self, then there's a putting on of the new self, and this new self is participate in the divine nature of God. Each has its own purpose. Right, Put off the old self to escape the deceitfulness. Put on the new self to participate in the divine nature of God. So we have 1 Peter 1, verses 3. Okay, verses 3 onwards. Uh, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So that's what we have just mentioned there above and what we're going to look at in this little uh, flowchart. So in this flowchart, I've kind of tried to make a picture out of this, a flowchart out of first, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. God, with his divine power, okay, his divine power has given us everything uh, through our knowledge of him. So God's divine power through what we learn, our knowledge of him. So Based on our knowledge, our learning of him, you see why it's so important to learn? Because learning God's word is where we have the knowledge that can allow his divine power to work through our knowledge. Then plus his great and precious promises. Okay? These three things, God's divine power working through our knowledge of him, together with the great and precious promises, will meet our needs for physical life and spiritual life of godliness. Okay, so these three will enable us to have live by bread as well as every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what can it accomplish? Escape the worldly corruption caused by evil desires is the negative one that we deal with. And the positive one that will change, uh, add on in our character is participate in God's divine nature. And this is to be realized, fulfilled through discipleship. And discipleship must be a non-compromising. It, it's not the discipleship of uh, patronizing, whitewashing, glossing over of standards and sugar coating of fluff and self-assuring and deceiving that we are all good, we are all blessed in Christ, 
with the result that we go on living a compromising discipleship of worship. So this is what it comes down to, the discipleship that does not compromise and the discipleship that ensures that we take the punches where the punches need to be given, the discipleship where the assurance that needs to be assured, the confidence, right? The assurance of salvation, the confidence that when we get hit by struggles and problems, we are still able to stand because we are standing on the great power of God, not on our own human esteem, which, you know, we do things, a lot of things, in, even in service for God, we do a lot of things to make ourselves feel fulfilled, make ourselves feel good. Yeah, and then we claim all the blessings as if, as if they are our work and not God's great goodness. Right, so that's the big picture of our significance as church, as people, right? And fulfillment of our destiny. Of the fulfillment of our destiny is through what we have been entrusted to do. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again, that your wisdom, your goodness, is so great, it's truly beyond our imagination. It's beyond us to even conceive of the things that you have in store for us. And Lord, often the things that we don't understand become doubt and uh, uncertainty and we can be shaken in faith. But Lord, as we understand, as we meditate on your word and your truth for us, we begin to see, Lord, that you have laid the runway and the foundation for us to know that our life is based on very firm groundwork that you have prepared and you have given to us. And your manifold wisdom will make happen through our obedience. And no matter how little or how much we know, we need to simply trust in you that you will bring all things to pass as you said, because you are the one who has the power and the wisdom and the authority to make it all happen. And so God, we pray that our faith will grow and we will not be fearful to obey you. We give you thanks and praise for all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.